Hey, what's up everyone? So I'm out of my own tiny tropical style garden on an afternoon stroll around Abbotsbury Subtropical Gardens. Now I've got the dog with me, so if you see me getting yanked off in one direction, she's seen a squirrel. But I'm gonna try and show you some of the really nice planting that's out either in flower or just looking lush and unusual at this time of the year. It's just gonna be a bit of a walk around and off the cuff video. It's on the phone, so the sound might not be as good as normal, but let's have a look around Abbotsbury Subtropical Gardens. This stunning foliage plant is Brassiopsis hispida, and I know that it's been in the ground here for two or three years now, and it's got through winter really, really well. It's not quite as hardy as Brassiopsis mitis, but equally stunning. Look at those leaves with the serrated edges, and it has that trademark spiky Brassiopsis stem. It's a really nice plant, and it obviously tolerates partial shade in this bed. Now the bananas here grow absolutely massive. In this spot, we're inside of the Victorian walled garden, which used to be a productive vegetable garden for a manor that stood nearby. But now it's the perfect spot to harbor these tropical and exotic plants. And so many of the plants that are considered half hardy absolutely thrive in this sheltered location. Now, something that's really interesting about the gardens here at Abbotsbury is that they barely experience any frosts at all. And that's because of the proximity to the coast, the topography of the land, and also the fact that it's under a blanket of evergreen oaks, Quercus ilex, and those evergreen leaves are helping keep any heat down in winter. So any cold spells, you very, very rarely see ice or frost here. Now just here, and I've come especially to check on this plant, is a Soncus fruticosa or fruticosis. This is a giant tree dandelion. And I planted this into this area as a small plant two years ago, I think. And I've seen it flower once. And it's great to see that after flowering, it just continues to branch out. And you can see it's got this really nice serrated lance shaped foliage. It's just a fantastic foliage plant for a tropical style garden. And if you can get it through frosts and cold spells, like I say, the garden here doesn't really experience frosts then it's going to get this big. Now, unfortunately, I lost mine at home in the minus five degrees Celsius that we experienced in the December just gone, but I'd love to get one to this sort of size. This is one of my favorite Pseudopanax in the whole garden. It's Pseudopanax cross linearifolius and a cultivar called Tuatora. It's got really narrow, really thin leaves, but they're not as delicate as they look. They are thick and leathery. And this one is growing so tall now, it's brushing the canopy of the tree above it. But it's just a fantastic foliage plant and it's thriving in this shady condition. A fantastic canopy plant that I don't see grown in many tropical style gardens, but that's used a really great effect here at Abbotsbury is that large leaved Aurelia. Now it's possibly Aurelia spinosa. It's in the same family as Fatsias, um, as Tetrapanax, um, and it's just a fantastic, I'm gonna call it a tree, but it's suckering. So you can also grow it to look as though it's a shrub. And it grows rapidly up on a single stem. You can just see the stem in the undergrowth there. And it will put out these enormous leaves every single year. And you get typical Aurelia berries emerging from the top of the plant in autumn and the birds love to eat these. This climber is one of my favorites and it smells really, really good. It's Marcinodina oreophylla and it's evergreen in mild winters, but semi evergreen or will potentially lose its leaves, anything below freezing. When it blooms, it has these clusters of white flowers that to me smell like ice cream or cream soda. And you can see how vigorous it is growing over this arch. Now this bed is maintained by an ex-colleague of mine from when I used to work here at Abbotsbury South Tropical Gardens. And it's a really nice mix of evergreen exotics, trees that have been seed grown by some of the other gardeners here, and herbaceous perennials that you're more likely to see in big herbaceous borders. But you can see how the two have been stitched together really, really nicely. Now this flower is an absolute magnet for butterflies. And you can see one 
just at the back there. It's Veronicastrum fasciation. And the fasciation is regarding these flattened flowers. And they're just a real magnet for pollinators. You can just see them buzzing around here. We've actually got two hummingbird hawk moths on the salvia just in front of it. Oh, I love seeing pollinators like this. It's really nice to see so many flowers that you'd normally see in just a standard herbaceous border mixed in with exotics like the banana at the back. Now for those of you that love palms, you will absolutely love this mule palm. It's a really vigorous hybrid growing on this corner spot here that's flanked with a lovely evergreen Ophiopogon grass, sometimes called Mondo grass. And just look at the size it's got to here in Dorset in the UK. It's got beautiful sort of weeping leaves that come off of these leaf stems. It's a really architectural plant. I reckon George from George's Jungle Garden would like this one. What do you reckon, George? This is also one of my favorite, if simple, plant combinations here at Abbotsbury. They've flanked this gravel path with an avenue of Camarops palms, and they're underplanted with Mondo grass, Ophiopogon japonicus. And every time I see it, it just reminds me of what you'd see in like a Balinese garden, heading towards a lovely warm blue swimming pool. Sometimes the simplest planting is the most effective. And look at the size of this loquat tree, Areobitria japonica. Now I have seen this one covered in fruit. Now remember with loquats, they flower in winter, so you need a mild winter for the flowers to not get frosted off. And that mild winter is also gonna help pollinating insects survive long enough to be able to pollinate the flowers and produce the orange loquat fruit. Now this one is towering up and under that evergreen oak there. And it's gonna help create that microclimate creating evergreen canopy that's covering most of the gardens here at Abbotsbury. Now these enormous ferns are the giant European chain fern, sometimes called the walking fern, because they actually grow tiny little baby ferns down on the tip of the leaves. There you go, you can see a tiny little bubble starting there. Now the Latin name is Woodwardia radicans and these have featured on the Grow Paradise channel quite a lot and we grow them in the Grow Paradise garden. But you can see here, they've remained evergreen or semi-evergreen after a cooler winter and they're growing fronds. Now each one of these fronds is 1.5 to two meters long. It's a really nice fern and it acts as a foil here for this enormous Trachycarpus fortunii, which is reaching for those blue Dorset skies. Now this really unusual bark and trunk belongs to a beautiful tree that I love. It's Calipanax septum lobus and it has these beautiful spiky stems and really nice deciduous foliage. That's not one you commonly see in gardens, but it's really well suited to a tropical style garden. Now this area is one of my absolute favourites. I'm being careful multitasking here as I'm going down the stairs. It's the fernery by the Bothy, which is a very shaded part of the gardens. And it's ideal for ferns. Now I absolutely love coming down here. Obviously on a warm day, you could sit under these tree ferns, surrounded by all this lush foliage of ferns like the Woodwardia behind me. And when you sit on this bench, you can sort of get a perspective of just how big these Woodwardia ferns are. And it's just lovely and cool. And you've got the sound of that coastal wind blowing through the canopy leaves. Love it, very, very soothing. And it's much nicer now that I'm not looking around for weeding jobs to do. I'm just here to enjoy it. One of my favorite ferns down in the fernery is this called the Australian Jungle Break Fern. Its Latin name is Teres Umbrosa and it will be evergreen in a mild winter, but if we get a frost, it will get frosted to below ground level and it will quickly regrow to this sort of size as it becomes established each year. I absolutely love it for these narrow leaves. It's much more unusual compared to what you'd expect from a fern's foliage. It's really, really eye-catching and it will get much bigger than this as well. 
there's also this really healthy Pseudopanax laetus, which you've probably seen growing in the Grow Paradise Garden. I've got this one at home. And now that I'm here, I think I might regret it because this one has gotten quite large since I last saw it. And this would probably fill up half of my garden by now. Now we're heading up Secret Walk, which is a winding path that goes up through these woodland plants up towards the Himalayan glade. And this part always looks lovely. It's a really nice mix of evergreens and herbaceous plants. And you've got some really nice large leaved rhododendron here that are just past their prime now. We're in the middle of summer, so all the flowers are done. Really, really nice. Now these bananas growing in the Himalayan glade are one of the few hardy bananas we can grow in the UK, but people don't realize just how hardy they are. They are Musella laziocarpa. They don't grow as tall as Musa Basdu, but they have such a striking yellow flower that earns them the name of the golden lotus banana. Now you're gonna be waiting a few years for these to flower, but when they do, you'll really be able to appreciate it. And after flowering, the main plant will die, but you can see they produce pups vegetatively, just like Musa Basdu would. Definitely one that's worth a grow. Look how big this eucalyptus is and how stunning all of that peeling bark is that's hanging down from the branches and from the trunk. Now don't get me wrong, eucalyptus are really beautiful trees. But who's really got a garden for a tree this size? So now we're coming to the bottom corner of this 25 plus acre garden. It's so much cooler than the rest of the garden. There are so many different microclimates here, you can see why they're able to grow such a, a wide variety of plants at Abbotsbury. But we're about to walk under one of my favourite trees, and let me just remind myself of the name to have a sneaky look at the label. So here you go, it's like a veil of leaves. So Cidophyllum, Japonicum, and this is a cultivar pendulum, obviously because of the drooping leaves. And these leaves develop a really sweet, like burnt sugar smell when they're in sunlight and in autumn when the tree is shedding the leaves. It's really, really worth growing. And you can grow it quite small, but look at the size that this one gets to. It's a, it's a bit of a giant, but if I had the space, I would definitely, definitely give it a go. Look at the size of the leaves on this giant. Now, not all of us are into rhododendrons, but if we could grow a plant like this at home, I think we'd all give it a go. Now, this one is Rhododendron protistum, and it's an absolute beauty. Now, I've seen it struggling for a couple of years, so it's so nice to see it bouncing back. I think we've had the perfect blend of heat, cooler days, and rain. I mean, I look like a borrower stood next to this thing. It's amazing. This one's a beauty as well, Rhododendron cyanofalconerii, and it's got a really nice silvery leaf underside. Maybe I could start a rhododendron garden. So one thing to note is that people always come to gardens like this that say they're tropical or subtropical and wonder why they see so many plants like hydrangeas and fuchsias, maybe even buddleias. And it's important to remember that these plants are all exotic and at one point people would have come from all over the UK to see the first one of these plants brought into the country and it's only through cultivation and finding plants that are really well suited to our climate that they become considered as everyday plants. I mean one day possibly we'll all be looking at tetrapanax and Brassiopsis mitis and just thinking of that as an everyday plant when the next generation of weird and wonderful plants is coming into the country. And almost like magic, we stumbled across a Brassiopsis mitis. And until they are everyday common plants, I'm still gonna get excited every time I see one. Now this one I think has been in the ground for two or three years. So it survived winter and it's put on so much growth. Now once these plants are happy, they're actually really, really fast growing. And you can see that the leaf form is starting to change slightly. As the plant matures, they're far less dissected. If you look down here, how deep the lobes are compared to the ones toward the canopy. But either way, still a very beautiful plant. 
So just to give you a sense of scale, look how big this thing is behind me. I'm stood just in front of it. I'm about six foot and it's towering over me. It's probably tripled in size since the last time I was here. And it's great to see that it's doing so well. And again, benefiting from the canopy of those evergreen oak trees. And perhaps there's something that we can, oh, I just fell down a hole. Perhaps there's something that we can all take as a little takeaway from visiting this garden is to give ourselves a bit of an evergreen canopy to help create that warm microclimate in our gardens. We can all do it, no matter how big or small our gardens are. You can create more warmth so you can grow more exciting plants. It's just about finding the right plants to help you create the right environment. Now this pond area is easily one of my favorite areas in the whole of the gardens, flanked by these giant Gunnera plant and there's this enormous fallen tree in the pond that's covered in epiphytic bromeliads. Now I have been in this pond up to my shoulders wading through trying to get rid of the duckweed and it's impossible. It's naturally fed by the water that runs off from the hills around the gardens here but I don't mind it. I think it makes the whole pond look really jungly and it's great to see that the lilies are in flower too. Now if there's one thing I miss from working here it's the sense of scale that you have in a garden like this. It's just something that I cannot achieve in my tiny little garden. So we saw at the start of this video, an avenue of Camarops. How about this? An avenue of Gunnera, absolutely massive, going over my head as I'm walking underneath them. I mean, this garden really does make me feel tiny. So I'm gonna be honest with you guys. If you hear me speaking quickly, it's because I always wait until there's a nice quiet spot where I can film and talk about plants because I'm used to doing this in the safety of my own garden. And it feels a bit awkward talking out and about in other gardens. So I'd appreciate your feedback if you can let me know how I'm doing. It's also quite hard to multitask. As you've seen, I've fallen down holes. The dog has pulled me down some stairs, but I'm getting there. I think this is almost a usable video. This fern, safely tucked away in a shady spot down near the fernery, is a giant. It's Lophosauria quadrapinata. And it often has a really beautiful silvery sheen on the underside of the leaves. There you go. Now, I would say that this one is still a baby. It has grown much bigger than this. In fact, that one over there was huge. But in recent cold, it got frosted off. There's one on the other side of the path. If I had space in my garden, or if any of you have got space, I urge you to try and source a Lophosauria quadrapinata because before long, you're gonna be able to put a bench under here and have a beautiful canopy of those lovely silvery undecided fern leaves. Much faster growing than Dixonia antarctica, but it won't develop a trunk. It stays at ground level like this. And that fern at the back there, that is developing a trunk, is a Cyathea tree fern. Now I can't remember if that one's Cyathea cuprae or Cyathea australis. Now when cold weather is forecast here, or at least when I was working here, we wrapped it in horticultural fleece just to try and keep it in leaf. Um, but if it is frosted back and you've protected that trunk, then it very quickly unfurls new fronds when the weather is favorable, just like the Dixonia antarctica behind it at the back there which are absolute giants. So behind that euphorbia is a plant that I keep suggesting that people use instead of bamboo. If you're worried about the invasive nature of bamboo, then try this. It's the common name is the giant Spanish reed and its Latin name is Arundo donax. Now it will grow from ground level up to this height and more in one season. And unlike bamboo or most bamboos, it doesn't send runners off that are gonna pop up in the neighbor's garden. It will just slowly spread sideways in a clump like any other herbaceous perennial, if somewhat faster than most. I really love using it and you can see it stays vertical as well. It doesn't arch like many Fargacia bamboos, so it doesn't use up much horizontal space. Really good for the back of a border or to add height or screening out neighbors. So these stems behind me belong to a plant in the Pseudopanax family, and it's called Crassifolius. And if you just look up at these leaves, 
It's such a bizarre plant. It's exotic to the max. Now, it's said that the leaves evolved this way to look dead like that so that any predators won't eat the plant. And as it reaches maturity, the leaves actually change into a completely different form once they're up and out of harm's way. How cool is that? This is one half of the dry border up leading towards the Mediterranean bank. And you can see the sort of plants that thrive here. Really nice Phoenix date palms, Aeoniums. Plant there I don't recognize, just look at the label. Nolina, bear grass. Again, benefiting from that canopy, the heat of the original garden wall. Really nice. And this one's at the top of the hill. So all that water's draining down from here down into the pond and the fernery. Now the Echiums are past their best, but you can see that this, which I think is Echium candicans, which is a synonym of fastinosum, or the other way around. It's a shrubby Echium that produces multiple flower heads. These would have been shades of blue and purple, and it's perennial. So rather than flowering and dying, it will flower year on year, but it is quite short-lived. The lily ponds at the top of the Mediterranean bank are so beautiful, full of lilies. There's a few fish in there. These are very, very old. They go back in the history of the gardens, but they are great because they reflect the sky in the garden down in the valley there. Oh, the dog wants to go in the pond. But if we carry on around the corner, and I'm gonna try and do these Mediterranean steps while filming and walking the dog. If it doesn't work out, it's been nice knowing you all. Okay, here we go. And they say men can't multitask. Look at that. Absolutely stunning across the valley and the rest of the garden that we've walked through. Now, I have by no means covered everything. And look what's just catching my eye down here. These plants are Watsonia. You get all different colours and they self-seed and hybridise readily. But these orange and pink ones are really beautiful. What a lovely day. Now these are the afternoons that us gardeners love. Lovely agapanthus in full bloom, loving this heat and the good drainage. And it pairs beautifully, that purple and that peachy orange of the Watsonia. What a lovely pairing. Sorry to take your eyes off those beautiful flowers. Down to my sweaty face, struggling to go down these stairs. But you can see the sun that's shining on my face here, this Mediterranean bank is south facing mostly and it's open above this part of the garden. There is no canopy over this part. So it bakes in sun year round, which is why so many of these sun loving, drainage loving, acid loving plants can thrive on this bank. And I say acid loving because there's a belt of iron running under this part of the garden, which completely transform the acidity of this section and lets you grow a completely different array of plants. So I'm gonna call it a day. I have by no means covered all of the garden, but it's getting late. They're gonna close the car park soon, so I need to get the car out. And I've got to go home to start preparing the boxes for this month's seed club. Now, if you haven't already joined the seed club, it's a club where we send weird and wonderful seeds out in the post every month. It's a subscription box with details on how to grow the plants, um, how to grow them on. And we have a forum where people support each other and share pictures of what's growing, what's not, and how to help each other out. So if you fancy having a go at growing your own exotic plants from seed, then have a go at joining the seed club. At the moment it's 12 pounds a month and you get three varieties in every box with illustrations that I've done of everything that you'll be growing. It's just a fantastic way to try and grow something special and it costs far less than buying some of these plants as plants. In fact, some of them you won't even find as plants growing in this country until you've germinated the seeds. Now, thank you so much for watching. And if you'd like to see more videos of me walking around gardens, maybe not multitasking quite so much, then let me know. If you've got any questions about anything you've seen, then stick it in the comments and I'll get back to you.